Check us out on our website, helixcenter.org, Facebook, Twitter. Let me tell you a little bit about upcoming event on Saturday, March 26th. It's the second of our programs on genius. This is Understanding Genius Women. And it's organized by poet, visual artist, and Helix Center Executive Committee member, Anne-Marie Levine. And Anne-Marie will be joined by Joyce Chaplin from Harvard, <coughs> Kathleen Keat from Trinity College, Darren McMahon at Dartmouth, and Susan Seymour from Pitzer College. And today's program is The Meditative State, and I will briefly introduce our participants. Sarah Lazar, Assistant Professor in Psychology at Harvard Medical School. Peter Malinowski, Senior Lecturer in Psychology and Cognitive Neuroscience at Liverpool John Moores University. Koshin Paley Ellison, Co-Founder of the New York Zen Center for Contemplative Care. Morgan Stebbins, Supervising Analyst, Jungian Psychoanalytic Association in New York. Yi Yuan Tang, Professor of Psychological Sciences, Texas Tech University. We'll start. Oops. Yeah, down, no, I think. Okay. <clears throat> So we start first. Yeah, I think um, it's my pleasure to be here yeah. Okay. Yeah. to share the research and the application related to the meditative mind, or we call the med meditative brain. So also, I'm honored to have the colleagues here, the audience here. So it means we have a similar interest. Hope our discussion can facilitate understanding about this topic or may help your practice. Yeah. For myself, I'm, I'm a neuroscientist and psychologist, but I'm also a long-term meditator. Yeah, 10 years ago, I moved from China to US. So I've been a professor in China since 1987. So I moved here as a professor at the University of Oregon first, Department of Psychology, then I moved to the Texas Tech University. So this is my background. So I can share the idea related to the neuroscience mechanism of mindfulness meditation or meditation. Or I can, and also can share the practice experience of myself when I learn in China. So I started the practice when I was six. Yeah, so it's a tradition. So maybe I have a different view from yours. <laughs> that you can help me. <laughs> so I have a question for the researchers, but you okay. since you jumped in, um, in, in my reading of the research, I haven't been able to find a coherent definition of meditation. Perfect idea. I will leave to <laughs> three of my colleagues. Yeah. That's a good question for someone else. I'd say for the. <laughs> yeah, no, I think um, many of us try to dodge that question. <laughs> you know, because when we turn and we ask the contemplatives, and they say, well, you know, because there's the meditation that we all think of where we sit and we watch our breath or we focus on something. But there's also meditative traditions, oops, sorry, uh, involved, like scripture reading. Right. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to meditate. So yeah. I think it's, it's one of those. Simone Weil is one of those. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And so it's, it's um, so personally, that's why I just, I pick one, I pick mindfulness, I pick MBSR. <laughs> Someone who's even said that's not even really meditation. Um, you know, and so I try to avoid the, mm -hmm. that question. Mm -hmm. So meaning you pick a definition or a form that's already uh, established and then yeah. investigate it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I actually, I also, I agree with, with Sarah. Um, even trying to, if we would try to define meditation as like, uh, with a definition that covers the whole field of meditation, I think we would give a very wrong impression. Actually, I think we would, it would suggest that 
somehow all these different approaches, and, and Sarah mentioned a few, that one could somehow bring them together and find some fundamental similarities, maybe, and then from the research perspective, maybe similarities in brain states or brain dynamics or, or whatever, and I don't think this is possible. And I, I completely agree with Sarah that the, the practices that somehow we cover very vaguely under the term meditation, they, are so, they can be so different that it would be futile to, to think that one could all lump it together. Sure. So I think a, 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 so that an overarching definition right. would, would suggest otherwise. I, I completely yeah. agree. That's probably why I asked the question. Yes. Yeah. Um, but it brings to mind another question, which is <laughs> that some proponents of some traditions think the idea of research itself is against the grain of what the tradition is for. I mean, David Lopez is right. one of the big scholars in favor of that view. I don't really have a comment because I like to read the research, but to, does that come into play at all? Yeah, definitely. I mean, when I first started, you know, people told me you're not going to see anything. It's all ephemeral. You, you know, whatever you're measuring is not relevant. I still get that actually. You know, so you get changes in the brain. What does it mean? Right. <laughs> and so, um, oops, I'm really. This is not long to stay here today. Um, so uh, and so. I guess I have a lot of different thoughts about it, um, you know, because meditation is vast, right? And um, it's not like I feel like, oh, we're going to do one experiment and explain all of meditation in one or two experiments. I mean, it's going to be years. I mean, pain, is, I think, is a really good example. People have been studying pain scientifically for 50 years, right? And I think pain is just as ephemeral as the meditative state. And you know, there's still a lot, they've learned a lot, but there's still a lot they don't know and don't understand. So I think, um, you know, and I often look to the pain literature to sort of, you know, for parallels and whatnot. I think it's, it's a useful thing to look at. Um, and so, but I do think there, I don't know that we'll be able to explain all of the meditative state with neuroscience, but I do think we can explain bits and pieces of it. And I think that has some contribution, especially, you know, in the, context of psychotherapy and, and medical, using meditative techniques in medical settings and clinical settings. Because then I think, you know, we have a sense of now of what's going on in the mind of someone who's depressed or anxious or whatever. And we have a sense of what's going on in the mind of someone who's meditating. And we can sort of see how there's maybe some overlap and how one might be able to help one another. Um, mm -hmm. So I think in a very limited sense, we can get at some aspects of it, but maybe not enlightenment. <laughs> Which is another one of those things that no one what? wants to define, right? So, and I guess that's part of my thing is, you know, if you can't define it, you can't study it. So, right. Yeah. So that that which we can define, we'll try to study. Yeah. And I guess if it's that broad, then we have to define little pieces and study that and put yeah. them together. Yeah. Right. It's so amazing. You know, I spent the morning in a meditation retreat mm -hmm. and. Uh, and coming here, I had to leave the retreat to come here, which was felt kind of ironic in a certain way. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to stop meditating to go to talk about meditating. And, uh, um, but also, I was talking with maybe 25 practitioners, you know, one-on-one -on -one during the morning, and they are all practicing Zen meditation. But I wouldn't describe any of them practicing really in the same way. Mm. Mm and how they're working with their mind in the same way. So I'm super curious to learn about how you work with variants of each person because very different. You know, even like some people are working and there's three different kinds of Zen meditation mm -hmm. and then there's people, individual people working in those, med those branches. So I'm just right. curious about in terms of study, how do you study that? I'd love to yeah. learn. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, personally, I mean, so we try to get people who are all doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. That's why when I first did the first study, I did everyone, you know, even just Vipassana meditation, mm -hmm. you know, instead of just all meditation. Um, and now, you know, with MBSR, it's like people going through. And so, it, but it's hard to know even then. I right. mean, because even though they may be listening to the exact same tape, what they're doing is different. Right. But the idea is that hopefully they're more or less doing the same thing. Um, <laughs> I don't know if yeah. you have other ideas. Do you want to see first? Yeah, um, this, this would be the idea and the hope yeah, that if, if people are 
instructed in the same way, follow the same approaches that, that actually also they do the same. And this, then this is reflected, for instance, in brain activity being similar. Sometimes it, it seems to be the case, but we have also carried out studies, uh, one particular study where we worked with uh, Tibetan Buddhist meditators, all from the same tradition, all going through the same training, all having the same meditation teacher. Mm -hmm. And when we studied them, they, during different meditation states, mm -hmm. with, with magnetic encephalography, basically pick, picking up the magnetic signal that the electrical activity produces, the electrical <coughs> brain activity produces, what we found is, or what we didn't find, is a consistent pattern of activity that was that was where we find any similarity yeah, across these I think around 14 participants. Yeah. Right. So but then we also scanned the, their teacher. Yeah. So and he basically, if you had never seen anything from neuroscience, yeah, no, had no idea actually what you're looking at, and we just show show someone the the visual representation of the of the brain waves yeah, if you want then actually everyone who who has eyesight could see this one is different yeah? so whereas at maybe at an intermediate level there there is a lot of Various, variation right. yeah. but maybe there are, there are very advanced states sure. maybe it converges more but i think from my perspective it's too early to really right. yeah. answer this but it's a good question actually this yeah. question related to the research and also application. Number one, like Sarah and Paul, uh, and Paul said, so when we want to study one form of meditation, let's see, mm. mindfulness meditation or just meditation. So you try to find the same teacher, same technique, similar participant, you want to control all the factors, right? It's not easy. I'll give you an example. So when I was working in medical school as a professor, so I worked with patients. So I developed a method called integrated body-mind training. Body-mind training, not just mind. So we call it IBMT. So we use the same teacher for the college students. So over the 500 subjects, just to see. There are similarity or there are the individual difference. So we separate the question. Number one, to see in general if people can benefit from this training. Number one question. So you know undergrad student, like American student, if you ask them, oh, you do the mindfulness meditation for 30 minutes per day, they say, okay, fine, I can do Monday to Friday, no weekend. <laughs> what? No, we can. I'm so busy. Yeah. Okay. So we do. So then we find that even though the five session of IBMT, so we find improved attention ability, improved positive mood, decreased negative mood, but this all self-report, right? People argue, what's the objective markers? So we measure the cortisol, salivary cortisol, to see all their stress hormone reduced. Mm. Then we, we find that the immune function factor, SIGA, improved. So you see, see my work. But you look at the 500 subjects, you find there are individual difference. Mm. Even though you deliver the same, like this is the environment, right? right? Everybody's here. Same environment, but does our brain interpret or perceive or process in a different way or same way? So there are lots of study, just one important study. So if this moment, we measure everybody's eye movement, millisecond. So this is the topic. You will find from Asian people, like Japanese, Chinese, over 90% eye movement, they focus on the environment. But for Westerners, English speakers, native English speakers, over 90% time, their eyes focus on the target. Asian people, American people, they are in the same environment, but they, they mm -hmm. perceive the information differently in a fundamental level. But they all see the targets, all see the environment, right? 
So then we study their brain to see how, re how, they how the brain responds. So then we find, even though the five session, 20 to 30 minute session, their brain activity change, mm -hmm. like a brain wave, like the bold signal, fMRI signal, then they are even further they go to five hours, so they change the wire matter structure. You know the structure. Also, this structure change correlated with their emotional regulation ability. You know, when we want to rewire the brain, that drive new happy behavior, so you bring structure change. Mm. But we do find many, many individual difference. Then we measure the physiology, if your heartbeat, breath, pattern, all change, they all change. Then we provide them to do the working memory task, creativity task, attention task, then you'll find most of people go to the similar direction, but some people faster, some people later, some people in between. So they call the individual difference, right? So I think there are lots of paper from Paul Sarah's group, from my group. So we have also have a review paper talking about the neuroscience of mindfulness meditation, the whole field. Then you'll find that even though many, many publications, many, many studies, but the field is still very young because the scientific research is just one perspective that addressed part of the question. However, this meditation practice is more experiential, right? Like when I move US from China, so the people say, oh, your method is excellent. Give me a manual. Then I will study the manual that we've done. Yeah, this is the mindset that I always joke them. Do you learn swimming using a manual in the water? <laughs> they said, no, I'm going to die. So we actually, you can study use a machine. Yeah, use lots of scientific research method, but you can also study from first person perspective, from experience. But this is still a mystery. I think need needs lots of people work, not just from research part. Do you ever control for other activities that give you the same effects? Excellent question. So originally, in the field, many people did a study just use one meditation group, before and after. But recent years, people find that there are several publications. Yeah, I think from some major labs, so they use mindfulness compared to another, even though the health education course so they find similar, no significant difference, at least the four papers I know. So then people, study, people start to use different control, active control. So our study always use uh, relaxation therapy. You know, relaxation training therapy is good for the anxiety, stress. So, but we never told participant that you are in the relaxation or you are in the meditation. We just, we just say you, you are in the, meditation and relaxation, so they believe the same. So some people even love relaxation. They say, oh, this is good for me. Some people love meditation. But we did find at least this version of meditation, IBMT, is better compared to relaxation training. So other people use other methods. And did you compare it with things like jogging or listening to music or uh, you know, there's a lot of things that change our mentality. Yes. Right? Uh, I think their study, they're using the yoga, they use uh, physical activity. Yeah, we had a study compare a long-term aging population for 10 years. So one group just a physical exercise. Another group, the IBMT meditation. So we find that they actually, uh, folk, uh, they actually works on a different system. Like meditation more works on the central nervous system, like a brain, mind. And the physical exercise more works on the cardiovascular system. But then they still work on the brain, just a different order of plasticity. And we've done a study where we actually compared two different types of meditation, actually. So we compared MBSR to Herbert Benson's relaxation response. And so both are meditating. It's both eight weeks clinical. Um, and there's differences in the brains. So I guess that also gets to your question a little bit. Um, but also self-report. 
some of the self-report questions were very different. Um, you know, some things are the same. They both reduce stress very effectively, but the psycho psychological mechanisms by which they worked were different. Hmm. The physiology was different, um, and the brains were different. So, um, and so we think that's really interesting in terms of potentially, eventually targeting different types of meditation to different conditions. That's what I was going to ask. Conditions yeah. were, were people, right? Right. Personality structures, yeah. Right. And there is a little bit of anecdotal evidence along those lines that some people, um, John Kabat-Zinn years ago observed that people who tend to have a lot of you know, worry in their head tend to do better with like yoga and sort of the somatic practices versus people who have more sort of body complaints do better with, you know, the mm -hmm. meditation. Um, and then also in terms of um, like anxiety versus um, uh, um, panic, you know, that, that people with panic tend to do a little bit better with mindfulness versus people with anxiety tend to do a little bit better with relaxation training. Mm -hmm. And so, again, no hard evidence on that, so don't <laughs> quote me on that one. But you know, there's some little tiny bits of evidence that suggest that that might be, you know, that there right. might be. I mean, an extreme example is I would imagine that someone with a panic issue wouldn't be a good candidate for a death meditation. No. Yeah. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But also, if someone's having a panic attack, you don't say, oh, just calm down. But you can say, okay, even though you're panicking, even though you're, just be mindful. What's going on right now? Be aware of it. And so they really respond to it, you know, so that's the idea. But again, no evidence for that explicitly yet. Right. Yeah. So when you say that, what happens to the brain when you say, oh, be mindful, what, what happens? Yeah. Um, so there tends to be more activity in the insula which is an area involved in interoceptive awareness. And there tends to be turning off of the ruminative part of the brain. And so it's a much more experiential experience, you know, which we do expect. Um, they've done a little bit with mindfulness and pain. Um, and that's really interesting. So if you look at placebo or uh, distraction or you know, cognitive restructuring and pain, they all look pretty much the same. And all those forms of pain control, what you get is the front of the brain, which is like the executive part of the brain, turns on. And the sensory part of the brain gets turned off. So literally, the front part of your brain is just telling the sensory part of the brain, just don't feel it. But with mindfulness, you actually see the opposite. The front of the brain turns off, and the sensory part goes up. And you think, what? What's going on there? But when you think about it, that's what happens with mindfulness, right? You're saying, just feel it without elaboration and without judging it, without trying to control it or stop it. And that's exactly what we're seeing in the brains, is that they're not trying to control it, they're just sensing it. But even though they have more sensory brain activity, they, and they're reporting that they feel it you know, the same, they report less, it's, it doesn't bother them so much. You know, the affective component, so the, the sensory part of it is the same, but the affective, like, oh, I don't like it, it's unpleasantness, that is less in the meditators. So it does seem like it's a, it's a completely different way of doing pain control. Well, that's interesting, too, that it sounds like, I mean, those are different. Um, meditations, different meditations seem to have a different effect on the brain, and it makes me think that one of my questions is, uh, what use is the person making of the meditation? Because I think we've found that people can use meditation, you know, to, let's say, repress something or to explore something. Mm-hmm. So, uh, which gets us into a different level of right. the discussion. Yeah, and it may be that different people need different things at different times. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's useful. I like to think of it a lot like exercise, you know, and so um, you know, different types of exercise have very different benefits, like weight-bearing exercise versus cardiovascular, you know, or, you know cardio. Um, and you need different things at different times and depending on your condition. And I think similarly with meditation, um, like I know when I first started, I, I needed fast yoga. There's no way I could do <laughs> meditation when I first started. Um, but now there's no way I could do fast yoga, right? And I really like the slow meditative yoga. So I think, you know. When, when you said um, that you essentially calm down the cognitive parts, mm -hmm. but yet if I understood correctly, if you tell somebody, don't worry about it, it doesn't change it. But when you say, don't worry about it, you're addressing the cognitive part. 
I'm not sure I understand the question, sorry. In other words, why, why telling a patient or a person who's worried or anxious, mm -hmm. don't worry about it, why doesn't that work? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I can help a little bit. Okay, go for it. Um, I think people may know the one phenomenon called the white bear phenomenon. Oh, yeah. So let's, let's do a study, that just a short, one minute. So would you mind close your eyes, everybody? Yeah, close your eyes. So just one moment. Then follow my instruction carefully. Do not think white bear. <laughs> do not. Please open your eyes. So what happened? You're full of white bear, right? <laughs> Yeah, because untrained mind just behaves like this way. You want to suppress something, they will be back. Right? So the life is full of opportunity, adventure, challenge, or you think it's bad part, good part. It's our label. We label this good or bad because we prefer that we think it's good. We, we don't prefer we think it's bad. We try to avoid, right? So in reality, I think for the beginning, in the beginning state, like I'm doing meditation today. So beginner. So I will try very hard to follow instruction, right? Try to surprise, control my thought, emotion. So then you find they, they get in, so the sensory motor, sensory or interception system in, increase. Also your self-control midline brain, anterior cingular cortex, they increase a little bit. But in general, let, uh, uh, dorsal lateral prefrontal, con effort control, they go down a little bit. But you, you struggle, you struggle. So some study, they find actually increase, some study find decrease, because people use a different effort to get the same way, like strategy, right? So then in the intermediate part, in the middle part, you practice, sometimes you can control, sometimes you cannot. So you are in the middle line. So you got the midline, PFC, insula, then you enjoy experience, meditation experience in some moment. So you reward the system deeper, called striatum, so star. Then you yeah, advanced, like we see advanced meditator, so even though they don't want to use a very strong control, but they just be there. So I propose two words, one called doing, another called being. So doing means that you, do very, you work very hard, try to get something done. It's American culture, right? We want a fast food, a fast life. Yeah, we work very hard, try to get what we need. So you look at the Asian culture, they propose a being. So sometimes being, just the being with you, being with nature or environment, is still a strategy. So the new book called Trying Not to Try. Trying not to try, like you deal with the white bear, right? You live with the emotion, you live with the things you think is bad. So I, I give a talk about doing and being. So audience said, why you use being? Being is so confused. Doing makes sense. <laughs> so I joke with them, do you know what we called? The person said, we call the human being. We don't call human doing, right? <laughs> yeah, just a joke. So that, but you know, oh, we may miss the some part. And this part related to the brain function brain structure, physiology change in different level. So I have a quick question for you. Um, was, that, was that conclusion based on your research or did it come out of the tradition that you were practicing? Good question. You mean the doing and the being, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, many years ago, this idea was from my practice when I work with people deliver the training, retreat. But recent years, I'm not alone. There are many, many scholars, they point out this being state. 
So like the like a mindfulness meditation, we have definition called yeah. So uh, pay attention to the present without the judgment, right? So it's an easy description, but it's hard to make it. Only you can stay with the being state, acceptance, openness, then you can feel something. But this is not related, only related to meditation. In your life, you have experience. In some moment, you forget time, forget the environment, you just be there. So give you, ask you one question. When you kiss your partner, in that moment you are kissing, I, do you mind working very hard? No, you forget. You are, you are there, <laughs> being there, right? I think that depends. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But here's a question for the researchers. How, how do you deal with familiarity bias? You know, how do you deal with the difficulty of not wanting to confirm in your research uh, that which you already want to believe? Yeah, that's hard. I mean, you have to try to build in good, you know, you have to build in skepticism. Right. right? Or you try to work with skepticism too, skeptics too. Because um, the thing, though, is also is that even, because I see this with papers, you know, uh, they have to go through peer review. So even if, you know, I'm a little bit biased, when I goes out to the reviewers, they're going to slam me. <laughs> so I, I really try hard not to, you know, and to try to put in the, the opposing viewpoint and try to think of alternative explanations. Um, yeah. Actually, I want to get back to your last question, though. Yeah. Uh, there is, I think, um, there's something called neurofeedback. And what that is, there's a really cool experiment that this guy at Yale did. And he put people in a scanner who had never meditated before. And there's a part of the brain called the PCC. And it's involved in just the little voice in your head and there's the mind wandering and the talking. And what he did is, when that part of the brain was active, they saw a lot of blue. And when that part of the brain was not active and quiet, it turned red. And so they sort of explained to them how to meditate. And you put them in the scanner. And then while they were meditating, they got, they were told just watch your breathing, right? And they got, saw on the screen either blue or red, depending on the activity of that brain region. And this one guy, you know, he, he's watching his breath, but he couldn't make it go blue. It just kept going red, meaning his mind was active. And they told him, you know, you, you, when you're, you're doing it right, you'll see this go blue. It's going to turn off. Um, and the harder he tried, the worse it got. <laughs> so then finally he went, oh, and he got the doing versus being. And he realized because he was thinking about his breath and like watching it and controlling it. So when he stepped back and just observed the breath, boom, and that part of the brain turned off and he got it and he got into a really deep state. So I think, because that was one of the questions you asked was, you know, can you get at it scientifically? And so at least in that one case, yes. Um, and so now the guy is actually trying to do EEG, neurofeedback. And so, you know, so with beginning meditators, because lots of times that it's true when you first start meditating, you know, you're thinking about things and you're mind wandering and the whole thing. So can you get that feedback from that one part of the brain and help you keep on track and help you be being instead of doing? But, but I also wonder about the, there's a kind of a bias in the meditation world about meditative mind being relaxed and peaceful and Hello. <laughs> we'll just meditate. <laughs> I think there's such a bias towards whoa. Okay. Exciting. Yeah. To peaceful and meditative and I just wonder in some ways even what we're talking about. Because if for example, myself, or when I'm working with my teacher, or when I'm working with my students, if I'm always just like, you know, rainbows yeah. and unicorns, and um, as much as I like rainbows and unicorns, it's not actually what I'm, why I'm practicing. Right. Um, and so I just wonder about the red and the blue, because I think if I'm not going into the red sometimes and knowing how to work with that, right. I'm so. I'm, does right. that make sense? Yeah, no, definitely. And so I think the idea is for the beginners, because mm -hmm. often people, they get really frustrated because they never experience that really right. deep unicorn state, right? And, and you need to be sort of in that deep, when you're in that deep state, that's when all of a sudden the 
stuff comes up, and then you know how to work with it because you've done, because you've had, you've had the, oh, and the stepping back and just observing and the being. Mm. And so I think you sort of need to learn that state first mm. before you can dive into, because otherwise you're just, it's just therapy, right? Mm. So. Um, otherwise you're just in therapy? What's that? Otherwise you're just in therapy? <laughs> right, and you're just, in just you're ruminating and thinking, yeah, so. Yeah. So in the Jungian tradition, it's, uh, there's a long history of meditative states and we try to track um, the way the imagination is activated or not activated around certain images. So it's, uh, just to address that question, it's not a chattery sort of thing. Yeah, no, I know. I I'm, didn't mean to slam therapy. Nope. <laughs> I love therapy, yeah. but yes. Yeah. But it's sort of... Everyone not, defends the, you know, the thing yeah. that pays their bills, so... Right. <laughs> when I think in really good therapy, you often get people into that same state, though. Like, I mean, the whole, you know, distancing and sort of <clears throat> seeing your thoughts as just thoughts, that whole thing. So I think there is a lot of... Between meditation and therapy. Um, but I guess that's the, sort of the difference, though, between just sort of, like, thinking about your thoughts versus stepping back and observing your thoughts, which again, I think good therapy gets you into that place where you're, where I you are stepping back. each one works for different people. Yeah, yeah. And they work really well together. That's my experience. And just talking to other people, they work really well together. One of the interesting pieces of research that I just read, which is not on meditation, is that uh, apparently, in general, of course, this is a generalization, self-talk kind of menta mentality states work better for men and worse for women. Hmm. Where is it from? I'll have to find it. <laughs> but how, how did they define works better? Um, again, I'll have to find it, but it, okay. it basically, um, you know, whatever you might define as a good outcome, meaning better feeling about yourself, okay. calmer, uh, uh -huh. less panicked, um, you know, you come out with a self-report and, a, you know, so on, that's better, okay. roughly yeah. speaking. The other one's not so good. Mm -hmm. I, I had but some... The question of what's yeah. better is a good one. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I was just curious. I had some thoughts about uh, this question with biofeedback. Uh, because actually when I'm, when I'm giving talks about science of meditation and so on, this question comes a lot. Yeah? Can maybe, with the idea, maybe I, can I speed up the, and the processes and so on? And so, f so far, actually, my view was very hesitant in in this respect. Yeah, for, first of all, from my understanding of the insights we have so far f regarding brain activity during meditation, I would think, I, I would not feel confident to say this is a, the signal, this is how the brain activity should look like mm. yeah. it, for mm. the state we are aiming at. Yeah? So if I don't know this, what am I feeding back? Yeah, so, okay, one can just try it and so on, but if I, if I don't know what I, the state looks like I'm aiming at, how should I give feedback, red, wrong state, green or blue or whatever, right <laughs> state? Yeah, so that's the one thing. And, but then more from the, from the perspective of a meditator and, and meditation teacher also, well, the beauty, I think, of, of meditation practice is that it's one of the, these approaches that doesn't require anything else than my mind. Yeah? So we are so used to giving away responsibility. Usually, it's, uh, at least in the UK, it's drugs. Yeah? So we go to the pharmacy to, to help ourselves to get a quick fix and a faster result. We like that around here, too. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you do. <laughs> so, but now here, there's a method where I can say, you only need your mind, trust your mind. You don't need any helmet, you don't need any EEGs, you don't need any co confirmation from outside with the technology or whatever. You only need your mind to, to practice. Right. And I, for me, actually, this is an inc incredibly powerful method or, or message also, which gives a, and I, which gives a lot of trust and confidence mm -hmm. and maybe you can also say responsibility to to the person practicing or wanting wanting to practice and that's uh, that's from from the perspective of a meditator that's the most interesting for me I say actually yeah. all the all the strengths all the qualities all the insights everything is right. in you not in the machine you put on your head well so and 
not from, I'm not a meditator, no nothing about mm -hmm. meditation. So you wake up in the morning, you meditate. Then you go to work and you are bombarded with every possible conflict. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between you who has meditated and me who hasn't? Lots. Huh? Hopefully a lot. <laughs> oh, yes? <laughs> so... A feeling of self-justification? Yeah. <laughs> so the idea is, um, you know, because you practice meditation, and the idea of practicing it is so then when you go out into the world, you can then use it. So the idea would be that you... Um, one person described meditation to me as becoming very intimate with the weather of your mind, right? Because you really, you're much more sensitive to the little thoughts and feelings that sort of flip by in the back of your brain. And so you're more in tune with them. So then when all that stuff happens throughout your day, you see them and you're less reactive to it. And so you're, it's all the acting versus reacting. I mean, he should probably answer this question, right? So the neuroscience can't answer this, but for the, you know, the teachers, they can tell you. You're, just, you're more calm, you're more centered, you're less reactive. And um, you know you're just going to interact, deal with it in a very different way. That's if you define meditation as a separate activity. Right. Well, and ideally, yeah. Idea, the idea is that you can carry the mindfulness in particular. You really can carry that throughout the day, and that you really do see your thoughts as just thoughts throughout the day, and that you know that and really with time it it becomes you know, 24-7, which is idealistic, but <laughs> it does, bits of it does carry through the day. One of the questions I have is the relationship between the, you know, a goal state, which is a cognitive, an idea, and whatever the process is that you find. I mean, Jung had this fascination with what he called natural symbols versus tradition, symbols that came from a tradition. And it, Meaning, I wonder if there's anything that we could call meditation that isn't bound to a particular tradition and therefore wouldn't have the goal mm -hmm. posts be already preset, at least rhetorically. Well, I think that's you. You go ahead. No, yeah. but I, I don't know. I don't know. And actually, I'm getting more and more confused as we talk. <laughs> <laughs> in general, good, like what are we actually good. talking about? Um, um, it's called mindfulness. Maybe um, I've been meditating too much, you know, today. But you know, but I think that. But I'm, what I'm wondering about is actually even are we talking about? There are different schools of meditation, right? And then there are subsets of all the schools of meditation, and then there are a million traditions of meditation. And I'm actually curious too about. Um, what I notice really different, differently about um, people I work with and, and in myself and in my own path and in my teacher's path is really this sense of, you know, the, in Buddhism are the three jewels, as they're called, the awakened mind, the teachings, and community. So, and I often get concerned, and I notice a big difference when people are practicing with those three and when they're not. Mm -hmm. And usually, most meditators, I find, are really into the first two. My own awakened mind, <laughs> and I'm going to study and learn. It's like so transactional on a certain level, but what about community? And so to me, I'm so curious if there's, because I know that in my own journey as a practitioner has, that's like the most challenging and rewarding part of it, community or sangha. Mm -hmm. and, and most people are like, yeah, no thanks, you know. Because oh. uh, it's usually around our family of origin stuff, but it's, you know, how do we, I'm just curious in terms of, is that part of the research or is it really just out of like a skill-based you know, learning a technique, or are you really looking at are people landing in a tradition that actually supports them in terms of their own awake, you know, awakeness, in terms of learning, 
ongoing learning, at least for a lifetime. And then, you know, community. Are they being supported by others and supporting others? Mm -hmm. So to me, it's also the service piece, mm -hmm. which is the natural, for me, it's been the natural response to, you know, a couple decades of meditative practice because mm -hmm. it's the only thing that makes sense in a certain point is being more loving mm -hmm. as much as we can you know? although that that doesn't you don't need a community for that you can choose whatever place that you're in and the people around you I mean as an analyst that also has connections to lots of Dharma groups I often find refugees from communities because communities have inherent goalposts and power structures and so I find as much crossover the other way you know, I think perhaps there's an ideal of community, um, but I think these days it's a, a little more of a polyglot, at least I know it is for me. So. Yeah, and again, I think it's also interesting because how meditation is happening here in the West is very, very different than how it's happening in the East. Right. In the East, you go, you have your teacher, you have a really close relationship with your teacher, and you live there, you know, in the, in the community. Whereas here, it's like, oh yeah, I go once a week and see my teacher once a week versus you know, and I'm doing my striving and my job and everything else like that. So it is, I think, and also lots of times in some traditions, like you go, you meditate in silence and you leave and you may not even know who the people are around you. Um, so it's, it's, it's not necessarily even really community in the same, even the meditation centers, let alone the science. Um, and I think the science varies tremendously. So again, my science is focused a lot on the clinical application, so we don't really look at that so much. But there are definitely scientists who are very, very interested in that question and who are actively studying that. Um, so it, it varies. And I do think it is a really important key piece. Um, well, I think the issue of community certainly is. I think yeah. a lot of healing can come about by finding your community, regardless right. of how you put that. And that could have right. an effect that looks like meditation. Yeah. Just from being embedded in a community where you do have a co-concern. But Kaushik, you seem to be saying that it's an inevitable out... You seem, you seem to be saying that it's an inevitable outcome of the deepening of your meditation. That it's, mm. You were saying that it's a natural process. Use no. that word. So well, you weren't, you weren't suggesting that it... I'm always cautious about saying what's, what's natural. Because um, I feel like everything's natural. I haven't found something yet that's not natural. Um, I agree with that. But I, I actually think it's the most terrifying for most people is to really, you know, be a part of something. And, you know, um, but I, th I can just say from my own experience, really working through it and staying with the discomfort, which I've learned through my meditative practice, and applying that to relationships over time. But it takes, you know, both the community and yourself or your teacher and yourself to have that equal commitment to staying with it and exploring. And to me, it's very powerful. And it's been so moving to do that. And has completely changed me, I think. I don't know if that answers your question about natural. Well, I had the sense that, I mean, that, that, that there might have been an, uh, uh, a point on one side that um, the community orientation is an inevitable process, but you, you weren't saying that because I think I would say you, were, you were suggesting that, that yeah. there's a, a, a cultural social context in which that well, orientation arises. Well, it is, or not. I mean, I think if there's a meditation community, like there often is, is. in mostly other places, but, right. you know, that's a very different kind of context than we have here typically. Right. Because I think what you're saying is that often here in the West, there's the least amount of emphasis placed on community versus in the East, there's much more emphasis placed on it. But I think another question you're getting at, though, is that, so in Buddhism, the idea is that, you know, enlightenment, right, or the highest is a combination of wisdom and compassion. And so compassion is a huge, and that is a natural outcome. I don't know if you want to use that phrase or not, but it is definitely one of the primary outcomes of meditation practice is really, really, really deep compassion for yourself and for others. So 
But do you, do you think, but actually this is something I'm always wondering about, do you think that, I think some people feel like that that's an arrival, that's a destination point? Well, And yeah. for me it's like a moment by moment, because like in one moment yeah. I'm like, how cool, and then I'm like a complete yeah. asshole, you know. It's just like, <laughs> you know, but it's like, to me it's like yeah. practicing like that, right. you know. Yeah. It's also a coercive goalpost. Right. I mean, it's very different than seeing what arises. Right. Well, you're right. There's a non-striving striving. You know, it's the... But even that. There's this aspiration versus goal, right? Because I think, again, in the tradition, mm -hmm. the idea is that if you are striving for it, you're never going to get there. Right. And right. so when you just... But you, if you, but you said it's an intention, but a very a loosely held intention is the way it's described. But why that intention? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, will, I will say, um, from my experience, both on your research and application part, so I started a practice when I was young, so no goal, just a tradition you practiced. So beginning... The tradition doesn't have a goal? The past is the goal. The past is the goal. Because in Western mind, we think we need to have a goal. Goal setting. We make a plan. We follow the plan. We will get it. Sometimes you can get there. Sometimes you not. Like I have a strong intention, motivation, want to marry a movie star. I make a plan. Can you make it? Never Never know. Probably. Or probably not. Very likely not, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that in my experience, I practiced. So I get some insight just within my mind. I know, oh, I'm going to medical school. Yeah, I'm going to work with patient. I practice my own. I learn from my teacher. I enjoy. So when I work with many patients, I realize, oh, I want to involve more psychotherapy, psychology, because the behavior, all work with people. You talk about community, yeah. So then I developed a method working with different people. So then I realized, oh, we missed another part, neuroscience. So we try to explain in a scientific way. So I work on their part. So I never push myself. So you have a goal to go to community. This is your goal. So actually, we, we have an intrins intrinsic motivation. It happens just when you can hear when you can find, when you're aware. So this is why 10 years ago, I quit my university job in Chinese universities. I moved to US. I feel something, so I moved here. So my colleagues said, this is a crazy idea. Yeah, you are well established here. Why you move there? It's a new country. You need to speak English, not German. So lots of challenge, but I feel something I want to do. So I just do it, right? Also, I all oh, I can just stay with in China. I focus on my research, fine. So I will think we have a different understanding about the goal. We have a different understanding about how to achieve a goal. It's related to early question yourself, self awareness, or what you call, you call enlightenment, whatever you call. It. So some people who have been working in the meditation many, many years, they feel some, something, they are higher compared to other people, right? They feel different, but actually the same. Many people never meditate, so they still have a good experience in life, understanding life. Like I was a long distance runner. When I was young, I ran a lot. During running, I feel the state similar as meditation. I feel that. So you're reading the book, you're watching the movie, you chat with a friend. So you're just daydreaming, you are in the state. It's not a mystery. So I will think a meditation just, it's an attitude, it's a skill, it's a decision. Whatever you want to do, you say, I don't want a meditation, I want a physical exercise, fine. So even if a meditator, I think we should keep a balanced way about a meditation. So we open. It's a journey. This is why I call it the path of the goal. But rather than I have a fixed goal, rigid goal, I need to do something. Because we have a lot of suffer just because we only have one option. We say, I only can do this way, achieve that way, that I can be happy. 
I can be succeed. Actually, it's not. So you use a term called a moment, right? Yeah, moment to moment, you can moment mindful, moment meditation, moment happy. This is life, so you enjoy. So I think we were born and to be here to enjoy the life rather than the suffer. Yeah, we can. Obama said, yes, we can. <laughs> we can't suffer. <laughs> we labor suffer. We labor this suffer, right? Jung thinks our suffering and our non-suffering together make us whole. So there's a different view. Uh, Sarah, is, are there any studies uh, with monks who pray all day? Oh, yeah. I don't mean Buddhist monks. I mean Catholic monks. Oh, um, I think there's been a few. I think so. A few studies. Yeah, not yeah. as many. Yeah. Not as many. And is that different than meditating and mindfulness? Yeah, I don't um, know. There's a, there are two studies, two studies related to the uh, prayer. Um, it depends on the different type of prayers. You know, some prayer just a prayer for something like the mantra. Yeah, some just like compassion, compassion based prayer. Yeah, so thinking about the, the goodness or well for others, a different practice. So they find some overlap in the midline of the brain, midline. So anterior to posterior, midline. Because this, this midline brain related to your self perception, self processing. Yeah. Also, there are studies related to the, how the hypnosis is similar or different from meditation. Yeah, it's an interesting study. Um, we also have a similar result. Yeah. So we compare the hypnosis and uh, IBMT meditation. So then we use a stroop task. You know, stroop task means, uh, so you, you name the, like uh, the red, the red, but I can read in red color, the word, or in green color. So you said the red, red color is faster. So red in green color is slower. You get a conflict, right? Psychologists always make trick, yeah? So people try very hard. Yeah, so then, Many, many people find after, before, after hypnosis. So you find that brain change because hypnosis can block your visual input. You know, hypnosis, hypnosis said, yeah, you, never, you see nothing meaningless. So your visual system processing back in the region, in the back region, so the blocked. So this why information could not transfer to the frontal lobe, cannot process the conflict. This is the hypnosis study. So if you use IBMT meditation, you find visual input still there. Then the region, brain region that respond for resolving the conflict, they work harder to resolve the conflict. Then behavior level, everybody performs the same. So brain level is quite different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I like sports analogies. So. Um, Running, swimming, golf, weight training, there's perhaps some common benefit, but they're also very, very different, right? You can gain very, very different skills and use different muscles depending on which of those you do. And my sense is that the same is true with meditation, that there's going to be some things that are common, but then each is going to have also things that are unique. And so I'm guessing with the, you know, like you were saying, with the, with the prayer, that there's going to be certain similarities that will be very similar to the, the Buddhist meditation, but other things will be very different. Um, does it make a difference? I don't know. I mean, it's more, you know, I don't know. And I think it's important. I think sometimes the way the researchers portray a lot of the meditation research, there's a little bit of um, holier than thouness with it. You know, like, oh, and we meditate and we're better than you. And I'd really try to avoid that. Um, because I think, it, you know, because I think it, it backfires, right? There is this huge anti-meditation movement right now. Like this anti, yeah, there's a lot of backlash. Of <laughs> um, and it, I often get this question, what about 
prayer? What about other, you know, what about Tai Chi? What about other, even f other forms of, of meditation? Um, because there is sometimes this sense of, oh, you know, mindfulness changes the brain and it's only mindfulness and it's, you know, better than everything else. And, and I really try to convey to people that that's not the case. Like, this is what we're studying, so this is what we know about. But it's not better, it's not, I mean, it's just different, but it's not necessarily better than other types of prayer or other, you know, mind-body therapies like Tai Chi or yoga. Um, and that each is going to have certain benefits and they're going to have things that are common, things that are unique. You know, but I think at the end of the day, they all have similarities of, you know, spiritual transformation and, you know, feeling whole, feeling one, these sorts of things. And so I think that's, you know, that's what's beneficial. Um, and so I think, you know, and so for me, it's not trying to say, oh, meditation changes the brain. It's, oh, how does meditation change the brain so we can understand how meditation works? So I think that's a slightly different uh, goal in the research. So it's not trying to say, oh, yeah, we're better because we changed the brain. It's, what can we learn from this? I wonder what would happen if you called it something different. What do you mean? Well, I mean, as an analyst, one of the things... Well, exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> what, 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 trepidation. Yeah. Trepidation, yeah. Right. I mean, you know, the question for me often is, what's the fantasy about what this is going to bring you? Right. Right. What's the interest in that particular form or the thing you've heard about it? Right. That's, that's the level a lot of people relate to it on. Right. So, yeah, what if you said, we're going to practice trepidation? I love, <laughs> I love that. Well, it's an interesting question, yeah. you know? Because yeah. there's this whole idea of intention matters. And actually, that's a huge thing right now, even, so even just within you know, mindfulness. Like, you know, if you go and you meditate for the purpose of reducing stress versus if you meditate with the aspiration of intending enlightenment, is the same thing going to happen in your brain? Even though you may be focusing on your breath, is it different? And Probably yes. And as an analyst, we have to put all of that into question because you have to wonder what's the role of the unconscious. Oh, yeah. I mean, right? I mean, the oh, new yeah. neurological studies show that most decisions are made below the level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure intention matters. Huh. Attention or intention? Intention. Uh, oh, you yes mean. it does. <laughs> <laughs> well, but again, so but again, this is why meditation takes you know, 30 years to, or more to attain enlightenment usually, right? You could earn an entire lifetime. But I mean, uh, it's, um, I don't know. Well, I, I just, what I'm drawn to is the mythology around Buddhism and who knows? We know that something interesting happened 2,600 years ago. We don't. Maybe it was a person. But you know, the mythology story that I like so much is that he was. You know, there was this guy. Maybe it was a guy. Maybe it was a woman. Probably was a woman. You know, and <laughs> you know, and there was a person there who was very secluded, right, and trapped in their own little story that somebody else gave them like most of us. And then he goes outside of that story and encounters a sick body, a very frail elderly body, and a dead body. And to me, that inspiration of like, oh shit, this is what's gonna happen. This is what's inevitable. And then what? And so to me, the motivation is I always have very deeply resonated with that. So how, if your actions are your only belongings, how are you going to function? And if we don't really face our vulnerability and frailty, what are, what are we going to do? So, and it's easy to say, but hard to do. Yeah, related to the intervention. Uh, very quiet. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Related to intention and the motivation, I think um, we have a certainly have a consciousness. Yeah, we are weak right now. We also certainly have unconscious processing. It's for sure. In meditation world, even though you change the name, because the name certainly has a meaning, because name is kind of suggestion, right? I have a Chinese name called Yi Yuan. Yi Yuan means one source. It's Chinese name. But people give me another English name, call me Mike. <laughs> right? But I have too many close colleagues, they all call Mike, so we get confused. So you call me Yi Yuan, call me Mike, I'm the same person. It doesn't matter with the label, right? 
But regarding the intention, yeah, intention, I give, I provide a study. I provide a study to share with you, yeah. So you know the smoking quitting is very hard. Over 90% smokers try very hard every year to quit smoking, but they failed. They have a strong intention, because the therapist said, if, uh, unless you have a strong intention, then you can succeed. Why this smoker has a strong intention over 90% fail? Certainly there are some underlying reason related to the unconscious change, habit, lots of things. So we have a study, very simple study. So we recruit a subject from campus, campus smoker. We never told them, we are going to help you quit smoking. No. So we ask them, are you interested in improved attention? They say, yes. Are you improve, interested in the stress reduction? They say, yes. So they come here. So we deliver the meditation, compared to relaxation training. So before study, we compare smoker and non-smoker, their brain. Then we find that the smoker has a deficit in the self-control center in the brain here. It makes sense, lots of studies show. Behavior level, they have a 20 cigarettes per day, 30 cigarettes per day, all this stuff. So we deliver the training, nobody really knows the goal. They say, attention, right? Uh, uh, stress reduction, no quit smoking. So after 10 sessions, 30 minutes per session, 10 sessions, within two weeks, we scan the brain again, then we find their center, self-control center, the deficit change, they improve activity, more control. Mm -hmm. Then we look at their behavior, if they quit smoking. So before, after, we have a self-report study, report, screen everything, every day, how you smoke, when. So most of smokers said, before 20 cigarettes, after 20 cigarettes, 20. So we are confused because we have a machine the machine can measure their air in their lung when they smoke, how they smoke, how many smoke. So it's objective. So objective show not 20 cigarettes, only 10 cigarettes. But the white smoker always report 20. It's a habitual response. So we show them this is the data from machine. Can you check your pocket right now? So they check, they say, oh my god, usually. I should not sing because of 20, but right now I got 10 left. It means I only smoke 10 cigarettes per day. So the smoker was not aware the behavior change. So there are studies indicating smoker have self, has a self-awareness deficit. This is why. This is the habitual response, everyday response. So we also find over 60% smoking reduction 30% smoke quitting without the intention to quit smoke purposely. So this study. So in conclusion, so we have ongoing study. It means when you want to change a habit, we always think, oh, this habit is bad. I want to kill this habit. So you actually put a lot of attention. You emphasize. But right now, we don't talk about a bad habit. We create a new pathway. Yeah, you build a new habit. You build something, then the habit is strong, 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 then the old habit disappear. Just like a river, go that way. I never stop the river, but I get another path, so stronger. So it seems that unconscious mind, unconscious change make lots of things, but we are not aware. Just idea, <laughs> but I have a data. Yeah. There's a lot of talk of mindfulness. Over the last two years, I hear it constantly. Mm -hmm. And uh, people who seem to practice it, I, I don't know exactly what it is. Ah, okay. But people talk to me about it, and they all seem to feel very positive about it. <laughs> and they feel it changes their way of looking at their life, at the world, and so on. So is this something we should be teaching children at kindergarten level in order that they have a different view of the world as they grow up? And 
Do you know what hovering attention is? Oh, they can't do it. But no, he no, said no. he did it when no, he no, was no, six. No. no, no, yeah, no, definitely kids can do it. Hovering attention, right? That's a, the what attention? Hovering attention. Yes. That's mindfulness. Right? So that's, I mean, that's something that, that I'm told therapists know about, right? Because this idea is that you, when you're in a therapy session, right, that you're aware of what the person's saying, but you're also aware of your own reaction to what they're saying, and you're sort of, you know, the meta-awareness, right? The awareness of your awareness, awareness of what's going on. That's the mindfulness. But, but my patients who are in analysis, they don't leave after 50 minutes and think, boy, this was so fantastic. It no. changed my view of the world, and... The, the sky is bluer. In fact, sometimes the opposite is the case. That's okay. Right. Well, because that's what, what he was trying to say is that th th with meditation, it's not always, but again, then this is where the intention comes in. Because during the therapy session, you're focused on the other person. You're not necessarily focused on, you know, that which you would focus on with you were meditating. And it is, because it's also the non-judging. So there's the, the awareness, but there's the hovering attention, but there's also the non-judging and working with what comes up in a very specific way. So that's, that's true. That's, so the mindfulness is both those together. Is this, how, how would you relate Ellen Langer's view of mindfulness to this? Very different. Right, so the mindfulness very word is a, is a tricky one, because I love, I love her view and her work. Mm. It's totally different. Right, and even, so there's John Kabat-Zinn's definition, which is paying attention in the present moment in a specific way, non-judgmentally, because even there's a ton. It's a lot of words. Yeah, there's <laughs> it is, but there's even that's controversial. Not even everyone agrees with that definition, but that's one that most you know is probably closest, kind of sort of to what people are talking about. Um, but, but it's sort of, it's present not, moment not awareness of and a lot of it's like the sensory experience too, um, as opposed to, but. But it's also based on a you know early text. Yeah. It all comes from a very early text, which is you know mindfulness is an aspect of the meditative path. Yeah. And you know it's also in the Satipatthana Sutta where that it comes from is like a deep exploration of your decaying body, too. So I hope. And other things, yeah. No, but it, like it's a pretty well, substantive part of it, and I just. I like to advocate for that. When we talk about <laughs> mindfulness, it's like to think about, you know, that you're going to die. And mm -hmm. actually, it really encourages you. For, actually, so when I think it gives a little fire to the whole idea of mindfulness, because I know many people come to our center, I'm like, oh, I'm ready to get my Zen on, a little mm -hmm. mindfulness on, and, you know. Uh -huh. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, let's look at this, you know. And... Uh -huh. So I think in some ways the, the reality of our own death is also part of what makes you, you could say, things become very vivid or what you were talking about or, you know, Maizumi Roshi, who is the founder of our lineage, is, you know, why he talked about the only thing that makes sense is to truly appreciate your life because to be mindful is actually to realize we have just a short time. And so and to realize we have a short time it's like, oh, right, all right, let's sit up here, you know, and pay attention. So I think also mindfulness has it's to have more that than component. than just telling somebody be aware of your mortality constantly. That's a story. Yeah. That's a, not, not a bad way to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's not that easy to be aware of no. one's mortality Impossible. all the time where other things are constantly happening. You'll have to sit in a room and just keep saying, I'm mortal, I'm mortal. I'm <laughs> <laughs> no, how do you... No, I'm, that's, I'm what they call it, I mean, that's what they call it a practice. How do you, you achieve a, a state where you are, without really giving it a lot of effort, that you are aware of your mortality constantly when our general intention in life is to live? Everything is about living. The cells of our bodies are living, we are living, we are looking to the future, we are looking to the evening, whatever we are looking forward to, it's all about living. Well, uh, I I have, right. Not about the future though, it's about the right now. That's the difference, like right now. Like what yeah. if I told you I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that a meteor is gonna crash down in 15 seconds and wipe us all out, right? What would you do these last 15 seconds, Run. right? <laughs> So that's, I think, the idea of the meditation is that... 15 seconds is not enough time to do anything, but... Well... And also, isn't the present moment basically a mythology? Mm 
Uh, uh, who's claiming truths around here? Yeah. yeah not me. Uh, I will say, I give example. I appreciate your, your, your views. Mm. Give example. Let's test. So if everybody here... Is this going to change our views? Yes. Yeah. If everybody so here... So you don't appreciate them that much. Can, cha- can live 100 years here right now. We can live 100 years. Let's see. Maybe not, right? Let's suppose we can live 100 years from now. So 100 years means 36500 zero, zero days, right? More or less, yeah. So now you calculate how old are you right now. So you say, oh, I only have 10,000 days. So you calculate same truth, but you calculate differently. Then you, you realize, oh, life is short. Life is short. You need to give yourself some time. Mm-hmm. At least the moment that you think, why, how, what I should do in a short life. We always suppose it's a long time I'm going to die. We never think. But you calculate the days, no more left. Mm-hmm. This is why we need to do important thing in your life, right? You do important things in your life, actually you take responsibility for yourself. You help your family, you help society, right? American call this land with freedom. Everybody wants freedom. In the undergrad dorm, everybody in the midnight at 2 a.m., they still know this. It's my freedom, it's my right. They never consider others. So this country needs responsibility, right? You, you think yourself, take your res- own responsibility, then, without meditation, you can still do good thing. I think this is important. Doesn't matter you call it mindful meditation, yoga, whatever you call. It. But the essence, the spirit remains the same. The reality is still there. Life is short. Do important and good indeed. I think this is important. You know, a, a lot of the discussion underscores reflective capacities. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious as to whether there's any research that looks at what the uh, meditative capacities or the the abilities of people, let's say, what is this ever taught to people with uh, mental retardation? Are there certain cognitive and or other capacities of the mind that are required in order to practice these kinds of skills? And the same, you know, because Ed's question was, was getting at children, right? Right. You know, what, what cognitive and emotional capacities have come online that can make something like this possible, or is it, or is it not? Right. No, definitely, and there's several initiatives right now to bring it into schools, and so definitely it's being taught to kids. Back in the day of the Buddha, there were supposedly seven-year-olds, you know, enlightened beings running around, and they were, you know, um, and there's also some stories of, you know, of, of very mentally challenged people learning meditation, and like, you'd have them sweep, you how know, you, just be mindful of sweeping. How do you understand those stories? Well, they're stories, right? So, but, well, yeah, I mean, so you have to take them with a grain of salt, obviously. But I think the idea being that you don't have to be, you know, a genius to do it. That it is, because I'm curious what you meant by the present moment is a myth, but, because that's the idea with Buddhism, right? Is that the, all you have is the present moment. Everything else is a myth. So the only thing that really truly exists is the present moment. It and seems, so, it seems like a lot of rhetoric. It, seem, it seems like? It seems like a lot of rhetoric. Well, how is the, so how is the present moment a myth? I guess I'm curious about that one. Um, I've never seen anyone operate without uh, reference to a sense of self, which is a historical thing, or to at least short-term, past and future, to people they know, which is embedded in memory, uh, so, even how if does they're that make, operating. So how does that make this present moment a myth? Because there's no such thing that we could talk about as a present moment except as a device within a traditional structure to get someone to do something. I don't think I follow that. (laughs) I don't know if I understood this, but I I mean, the way of, of course, of defining the present moment 
is that it's a moment between the past <laughs> and the future. Yeah? So, so in this sense, it's, it's also nothing that can be found independ I independently. Right. Yeah? So I don't know if this is what, what right. you're I mean, I, I find that there are people that need to, if for their own good, not according to mm. my um, you know, evaluation, think more about the future. Yeah, and, but, but I, my understanding is that the emphasis of on the present moment, being here and now, and, and all kinds of metaphors in a way. It is, it is to make people aware of how much of their time they spend ruminating, engaging with the, the past, engaging what is happening with the, what might happen in the future, rather than experiencing themselves in the situation. You know? and, and for this, and I mean, this kind of metaphor of a present moment is used. So be here right and now, but, but then if you look deeper, then wh where is this, this present moment? Of course, I, I see it more like the pendulum in, often in, in our experience is so far either in the past or in, in the future, so that actually the, also the relationship that, that happens or can happen in a certain situation doesn't happen because our, our mind is somewhere spinning in, in, other, in other realms. And for this, then you say, okay, bring the pendulum a bit more to what, what is happening right now. Yeah? Sure. But then if you say right now, then no, you can't find the right now. Right, and I think experientially or in a relationship, you can find that and you can experience it. Mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. think that the way that it's used is very different in the rhetoric of the religions we're talking about. Well, but actually, I think it's sort of interesting what you just said because the whole point is to be in the present moment to lose that sense of self, though. Like you said, this, if the moment, present moment is a myth because you're always thinking about the past and the future, so... You don't think it's to express your true self? To be in the present moment? To, isn't that to express your true self? Right, which is not your history or your future. Why not? <laughs> well, that's quite, right? That's what they're saying, that if you get into that moment that it is not future or self, not past or future, that is something different. And that's like now the, we're talking about what other people say, though. Well, no, well... <laughs> Okay, I think I've had very brief moments of it, mm -hmm. you know, and it is, it's different, you know, just like a pure awareness. Mm -hmm. well, I, think, I think the, the present moment, just present moment, doesn't need to lots of discussion, argument, because from the theory, you will never understand the moment. <laughs> it's just a moment. Yeah, you sit down on a chair, then you feel your body touch there, it's a moment. But we, many times, we, we're not aware. So, but just, uh, you cannot uh, meditate for 10 minutes, five minutes, but you can meditate momently. That's it, right? And in their moment, let's see, you forget the past, put aside the future, their moment. So what's your mind? What's your body? What's your emotion? No thinking, just I'm there, I'm here. So you feel more space, more relaxed, right? But if you're thinking now, thinking moment, you're still not in the moment. I think it's based on experiential, experience feeling. This definition beyond the concept. So I think in Western world, when I move here, I realize, yeah, the Western world love language, love concept then action. But the Eastern world, they experience first, mm -hmm. then they conceptualize later. Mm -hmm. I think they, we can learn from each other. So maybe it's better. We label it's better, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think we can go to the questions yeah, well, from the floor. People could line up and please state your name and please uh, make your comments brief in the form of question. Is the fun part. Good answers. Hi, my name is uh, Nomi. I work in a library and I see what people choose to read. And uh, there is definitely a narrative specificity to all the great traditions that we are discussing here. Uh, being mindful uh, can also happen to a soldier, to somebody who is out there killing for the group that he or she belongs with. Mm -hmm. So there is a suggestion that, you know, can mindful really evolve consciousness from egocentric to ethnocentric? to world-centric, to cosmocentric, 
if people remain stuck with the group that they were raised in or the narrative that they consider are more sacred or they have been have they have they made a difference for the last so many centuries that all these great narratives have existed have they created evolved human beings who are more world conscious more sentient you know are there uh, non meat eaters among jews and christians and muslims because that's not part of their narrative but it is part of hindu and uh, buddhist narratives thank you so okay uh, question for peter oh i'm sorry oh. So, well, the, uh, I'm Does not sure the question was. To respond? Uh, I got a lost uh, about the long description. So, <laughs> what's the actual question? Could you reframe the. Question the was that all these great narratives have existed for a very long time. Has it evolved humanity? We're spending more than two trillion on weapons to kill fellow human beings from all these great traditions. Uh, has it evolved humanity? Because there is definitely religion is a very powerful force, and meditation is an integral part of all great religions. But is it making a difference to an individual in terms of becoming more world conscious, becoming more sentient uh, in terms of the way we live everyday life? Well, and of one, yes. <laughs> Certainly for me, it made a huge difference. And also, you said, um, you know, the soldiers being mindful. So again, this gets a little bit into different traditions, but at least in some of the traditions, the idea that one aspect of mindfulness is compassion. So they would say that a sniper cannot be mindful. They can be aware of the present moment, but they're not actually being mindful because they're having the intention to kill rather than intention to help. So, well, but that's that's a limited definition of a yeah. sniper, I would say. Yeah? So, yeah. Right, or a samurai. I, in, samurai. In some situations, I would I would really hope there is a sniper. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and it can be the most compassionate action to act as a sniper. It's not, I, I think, it's not the standard situation, so, but if we go to the ex extreme to condemn people who decide to put their life on the line to protect others, I, I, I'm not so comfortable with this idea, to be honest. Yeah, so in, in probably 99% of situations, or 99.9 or so, well, I agree, yeah. but there are other situations. And but again, that comes into intention, though. So I guess if it's the compassion yes. for the person you're protecting versus the hatred of the person you're killing. Yes, but, uh, yeah. but you can be a very compassionate sniper, at least in theory, <laughs> I think. I don't know. Well, so I don't know how it is practiced, uh, because I'm not in the army. I mean, Steven, Steven Pinker, if we, you know, I don't know where the evidence is exactly. Steven Pinker thinks that there's less killing per capita now than there has been hmm. in all of human history. So, uh, you know, so that's a possible answer. I, I don't uh -huh. think I have an answer. You have an answer? You have a I'm deeply concerned about the world. I feel like the world, the natural as we know it world is in deep trouble. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's not a lot of meditative mind <laughs> in if you open the paper in politics there is so much polarization. There's so much you know, focus on what, you know, transactional approaches to things. What am I going to get? And I'm deeply concerned about mm -hmm. those things. I don't have the answer, um, but I'm concerned about it. I Thank can say you. that. Me too. So, again, a uh, question for Peter about the teacher whose uh, brain imaging was clear to everyone that there was a differential between mm -hmm. a resting state and his, mm -hmm. his imaging. Uh, and also, of course, the students. Uh, what was the nature of, that, uh, of the activity imaged? For example, was it uh, more of a pancortical activity? Was there more synchrony between different brain areas that was persistent over time? Mm -hmm. or what, what, what was it? No, it's, actually, it was across a whole range of, of parameters, mm -hmm. if you want, including increased oscillatory activities in the ho almost in the whole frequency range that we usually look at, right. from v very low frequencies up to, well, in this case, we looked up to 128 hertz, mm -hmm. so across the whole spectrum. And also, um, I think it was a few years ago, um, yeah, and this actually also when uh, ha uh, evident in different meditative conditions. Uh, yeah. Was there any, um, and I forget the name of the brain structure right now, forgive me, but there's something unique in the human prefrontal cortex, it's bilateral, mm -hmm. that is, uh, if, uh, there's a recent paper about this, uh, about six months ago, 
that is dedicated to projecting multiple potential futures uh, and uh, enabling simultaneous evaluation, mm -hmm. uh, probabilistically, of which is best to engage, best to follow. And if I could remember, that it would be easier, but remember the name of it, but I would be, I would submit possibly that that was uh, actually lower activation, uh, because that person would not be so engaged in planning uh, either uh, mm -hmm. on, a, on a very basic level or on a very conscious level, and it's just a speculation. So it's a little more complex than that. Okay. Because what happens is, so yes, some area may get turned off during meditation, but what's really clear is that the wiring is actually changing, and oh. so, and how that area may be wired to other areas is changing, and so, because it is the case that, you know, when you're not in meditation, you know, you may need to be thinking about your future, and you may need to be planning, you know, and seeing your three different possible futures or whatnot. But when you do that activity, your brain's going to be wired a different way, and so you're going to think about those three options a different okay. way. Okay, thanks. And just a Thank comment you. that if anyone wants to respond, but I, 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 I was thinking that the problem with the... Uh, the, the, the now doesn't exist, and the now is the only thing that exists, is that we're in different contexts. The former is really from physics, right? Because uh, time is continually flowing in a unit, uh, well, there are some exceptions on the quantum level, time reversal, but aside from that, that it is the case that it's flowing from future to present, and that moment is just a transitory uh, entity, if you will, a passage, not a thing in and of itself, but from the awareness of the process of being a, a temporally aware individual, there's only the present moment. Um, that's how I see it. Thank you. Um, related to the question of biases that came up briefly, uh, there's a major problem in many areas of psychology these days about reproducibility of results. Um, journals only want to pu publish positive results. There's really no incentive for uh, people to reproduce other experiments. And I'm just wondering how this area of research is dealing with these problems. That paper was debunked. No, it wasn't debunked. Oh, it yes, questioned. it was. No. Was that? No, there's a paper that just came out. I know about and they it. Reproduced, I know about it. And they couldn't reproduce their findings, and they found right. all sorts of problems yeah, it, with their science. It wasn't science. as bad as they did, but it's still a major oh, problem. No, not as bad as they thought, though. So in the yeah, end... Right, not as bad, but it's a problem. Right, because the original, <laughs> sorry, because the original paper said that only 30% of the science could be reproduced, but in truth, it's closer to 80 or 90% that could be reproduced. Mm -hmm. so, oh. Yeah, that's what they found. When they actually went in, and then that's the thing, is they said that the people who did the original study used really poor methods, both in how they reproduced the study and in tried to reproduce the studies and in the math that they used. So for instance, one of the studies they did, um, the original study was done in the US with, I forget what age, and then the reproduction study was done in Europe with like a completely different population. And so they didn't reproduce it, but it was like, okay, well you didn't reproduce the conditions, they were even close to reproducing the conditions. So what are you doing in your area to reproduce it accurately? Right, so we are doing reproduce, so good science, usually what you do is, you do a study, and then the next study, you reproduce it, but you add something extra to it. So that's what we're doing. So our first study was, we showed there were changes pre, post, eight weeks of practice, right? But that's all we did was show changes in brain structure. So now we're doing a study, you know, um, where we're doing that, but then we're also adding additional measures so that we will be able to hopefully reproduce what we did, but then we'll also be able to add on to it. And I think a lot of scientists do do that, where there is replication inherent in the study because in order to build on it, I have to reproduce it to then do the next steps with it. Yeah, you need other people to reproduce your results, and you reproduce other people's results. Yes, yeah, definitely. So. I mean, definitely, I mean, I think I've, you know, just done some stuff that he's done, and there's definitely, so that's the thing, I think that it was a very sensational paper, that original one, and it's gotten a lot of attention, but in fact, I don't think this situation is anywhere near as bad as people are trying to make it out to be. There is a ton of reproducibility in science, and there's a ton of Me Too science. So a lot of this stuff really does get reproduced. But the, I would still think that, I mean, now if we applied this, this question of how much is reproduced with, let's say, within meditation research. I think most of the results we have, they are still on, on quite shaky feet, I would think. We, we see some convergence, 
but most of it, uh, for, for my taste, it's not sufficiently replicated and the evidence is not sufficiently strong that we can really stand there and say this is exactly how it is. Yeah? And, and I, I mean, even if, if this particular paper and so on, one, one can question it, that I think it is, for me at least, it's a general concern how, how our, uh, the science economy functions. For that actually yeah. I'm rewarded in my career if I do something sexy and I'm not rewarded in my career if I do something really solid yeah? and, and, and this is uh, I think it's a real concern it's r rather rushed to do something new to get in, into, into the, this particular journal that only publishes it if it's completely new or you have very good connections um, <laughs> and, and things like this yeah? so which is a real problem and if now another problem I see for instance in in this field of meditation research there's so much attention and uh, and meanwhile also money funding going into particular programs and the most uh, popular ones are mindfulness based stress reduction mindfulness based cognitive therapy particularly in the UK that actually this is where all the resources are sucked I into this is where all the people are trained in this is where, well, where the whole attention is on. And this means that at the same time, alternative approaches don't action, actually even have the chance to demonstrate their if effectiveness and so on. So actually, what I think what we're seeing to a large extent in this field, it is a narrowing instead of a widening. Yeah? And hopefully it's just a short-term narrowing that then later on it gets wider, but I, I don't know. Yeah? So actually, Although I, I know that there's a lot of discussion about this particular point, I think what they emphasize something that's that's true for meditation research, I think, and that's also true for other areas, not only psychology. And I think most of uh, the m models in in physics have never been replicated because there's no no research to to do them. They're just theoretical models anyway. Yeah? So th that's a, another question, yeah. maybe, but. So well, the, the, that, the strengths of the evidence, I, I think we have to be really careful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I totally agree with that. And my question about bias was, hmm. I, I like that Direct. counter question, but it was hmm. sort of philosophical in the sense that I've never seen research uh, go very far that contradicted the personal opinions of the researcher. Right, or to put mm. it the other way around, right. everyone that enters a, a given meditation tradition that has a good relationship with the people in it, prove to themselves that that tradition is correct. In other words, they, they get the results that they were looking for. Yeah. Well, I know, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> then, then it just... <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Jesse. First of all, thank you for all sharing your insights. I really enjoyed the discussion. Um, my question is, I, I, I guess I'll start with, um, I've studied a lot of like Buddhist teachings um, and various teachings regard that have a lot of meditation in them. Um, and one thing that I've always came across is sometimes a lot of the teachings either brush away parts of, human, of, of being a human um, or they contradict themselves. And one example is relationships. So the, the notion of non-attachment you know, was a huge thing in Buddhism, in particular, about not being attached. Um, but then there's all this mindfulness jargon about mindfulness and relationships and not being attached in romantic relationships. I'm like, what the hell does that even mean to not be attached in a romantic relationship? Like, doesn't that contradict itself? No, it um, so I guess my question is, is like, <laughs> I, 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 sometimes it feels like people are just avoiding the, the big elephants in the room um, when I talk to them when we're talking about mindfulness um, and the fact that we are imperfect beings and, and actually, I don't even know if I want to say imperfect because sometimes it suggests this notion that, um, as we were talking about earlier, this holier than now, uh, holier than, I don't know how you say it, holier than thou um, notion of, of being a kind of guru that is above the um, base desires like sexuality and the desire to really connect with people um, and be angry when in reality it's like, you know, if 
if if lust and anger and all of these other things that we that it seems like so many times I hear put down are very real and we feel them, um, how do how do you address that? <laughs> ah, huh, huh. What a wonderful thing to explore, you know. At least for a lifetime, I think. You know? I mean, I don't have any answers, certainly, but I, um, I'm not even interested lately in answers about it. But I think that one of the things that's a common misunderstanding is that there's this idea of non-attachment, which is really what it means. The original meaning in a clay show was that it's about not clinging, which is very different from feeling an attachment. Right. And, but when I, I know when I want to cling to something, it doesn't feel great. It doesn't, if it, whether it's a person or a state of mind or some outer reality. Wow, it feels shitty, you know? And, and also, or when someone is being clinging towards me, it doesn't feel good, right? And so to me, it's about just, you know, one of my favorite Zen teachers, uh, Uchiyama Roshi, he just talked about maybe the whole practice is learning how to open our hand. You know, so in some ways, about just noticing the moments when we're like this and learning how to open our hand. So it's, we're not clinging to something. It doesn't mean you're not feeling a connection or love or desire or anything, but it's not like mine, mine, or yours, yours, you know? It's like, I don't know. So another, because I've had similar, for me, I think it's important, what I was for me was um, understanding that a lot of the teachings in the time of the Buddha were aimed at monks, you know, people who are not lay people, and he had very different teachings for lay people than he did for the monks. And so the whole thing of, you know, extinguishing the fires of lust and greed and hatred, that's for the monks. You know, he doesn't expect the, you know, householders to be able to do that. Because, I mean, you really, you need 30 years in a cave to do that. So, um, <laughs> but I think it's something to, you know, decrease those. And I think by the way he's talking, of like, you know, not being so tightly attached. So it's, it's not eliminating, it's reducing. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, I like that somebody had said uh, everything is natural. And um, so my question is on anxiety disorders and kind of the unbalanced mind. I had a panic attack, which I never had before. Um, uh, few months ago back in November and kind of found myself stuck uh, in a kind of fear of fear kind of place and um, I downloaded this app called Headspace which is like guided meditation and uh, that has really helped me find um, a balance of mind again and return to normalcy and uh, but there was a push when I first went to the doctors for going for um, to for medication and stuff and since there's like a history of depression and stuff in my family um, they were leaning towards medication but I found that I didn't want to go that route because I've seen the effects of medication that I've had on members of my family so I, my um, curiosity is if there is any uh, a data that you guys have or, or thoughts that kind of reflect that kind of uh, similarities or differences in the changes of the wiring of the brain or the functioning of the mind um, between medication and meditation. Mm -hmm. There are studies, yeah. Well, I, I, yeah. I mean, okay, I'm, I'm first not talking about the neuroscience, but more on, on the clinical data. I, I would say, I, I've, before I, I, I mentioned actually the, the data is not very robust. Yeah? The, the one area that has where the data are mo most robust is actually the use of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy for treating people with recurrent depression. This is the best established evidence in the whole area and there the evidence shows that it is as effective as medication. So, and the basic, what, the, what it actually means, you c I think you can choose between meditation and medication. Yeah, <laughs> so that's, that's yeah. And, and then, at least in the UK, for now there's a big discussion how to 
w with depression being such a such a huge problem in or, or uh, yeah in in society, how to generate a uh, provision for this? Yeah? So how to make sure that actually there there are enough people who who can offer mindfulness-based cognitive therapy because it's not something you can just pick up like this, do a weekend course, and then you're you're there. Yeah? But so from from the clinical research, the, I, I would say this is the best established evidence that we have so far. Yeah, and so and, and maybe you want to say something from yeah. the neuroscience. Side. So uh, if you if you decide to go for the meditation or medication or physical exercise, actually it's your choice, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure different medication may work on your brain, on your body in a different way. They target different system. Right? They target certain system that also influence the other system. Let's see, you use a term called a balance, right? Refer to your question, balance, yeah. So you know, if a person has a depression problem, so the doctor tend to give the stimulants, try to change. If more anxiety, more anxious tend to use the depressant, this kind of medication, try to balance, right? Then you will see how brain responds, how physiology responds. If you overdose it or wrong dosage, it'll go to another extreme. So you go to the meditation or swimming or working or walking or others, it's a natural way. But meditation ha is helpful, but doesn't mean to fit everybody, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Nothing can fit everybody. So it's your choice, but you need to study, but more so engage in the concept, data. There are so many things. You ask your good friend, you ask your family member, you ask people who love you, give you an idea, maybe much better. Well, and it sounds like you found a good one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank, you. yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, so my question has to do with belief, right? I feel like in society, especially Western culture, I can't speak about Eastern culture, I haven't experienced it. But with Western culture, there's an absence of belief and faith in society, you know, there's a decline of religion and, or, you know, at least uh, classical forms of religion and more interest in mindfulness uh, or, or, or meditation, these different types of, um, I don't know, self-sustaining uh, understandings. Um, so my, what my question really is, is what is the importance of belief? And I don't mean in the sense of like, yes, of course, if you believe in something and you do it, then you, you are likely to to obtain what you've set out to do. But in the, in the actual meditative state, I mean, do you have to, we talked about being, right? So, so I mean, is there a belief of being or is there an absence of belief? Well, I'm a little confused in that regard and I'm, I just want to understand belief's uh, <laughs> relevance to the meditative state. I got a point. Yeah, actually, the being or doing or whatever other term it's not uh, the thought process. It's action-based process. Like you feel hungry, you get eating. You feel thirsty, you just drink, right? So I think Western mind want to make everything precisely control. Like we have uh, exact language. I'm going to visit London tomorrow. I use I will then tomorrow. Actually, it doesn't need will. I go to London tomorrow. Tomorrow, all, everybody knows the will, right? So we try to conceptualize everything in detail that we believe, okay, we can move from here. But in reality, many, many things is beyond the concept. You learn language when you're a child. You just learn from implicit learning. Right? Yeah, many, many things. We have two ways you can do. Explicit learning, so you want to find out the meaning, concept, the reasoning capacity. Another part, implicit, most of gut feeling. So when I train the people, I always encourage people to make decisions, to follow their own heart and feeling. Sometimes you feel good, you do it. Not good. I don't listen to others, I follow my heart, my feeling. 
because most of people are living in a small box. We are fixed, trained from previous experience, learning, school, education, parents, media. But we never think how we should do. But we, on, we were only told what we should do. We never think why, how we can do, we can create differently. I think their part, you need your own thinking. Confusion is a good step. Confusion means you're thinking different ways, right? You're thinking different ways, you compare, then you find a way. In this reality, actually, just based on your question, you don't need to worry this is good, this is bad. This thing will help you, help others, not harm others. You can do. You learn, you're learning from doing. This is the present moment, right? But it, it's so, I would just add, I really appreciate what you're saying. And that I know many people come to our center to learn how to meditate because they have a belief and faith that they're going to feel more peaceful and better. They're going to feel better. And I usually try to raise the flag of like, this is not the place you want to come then. Because actually it's not about that. It's about being with whatever is arising. But if you're going for better or you have a belief in that you're going to feel better or peaceful or serene or whatever it is, you should go to somewhere else. You know? And so I think in some ways some of the beliefs, I think, sometimes get in the way of actual our experience. So maybe go, going back to your point about just the path itself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, my question has to do with meditation and its effect on job performance. Specifically, is there any study out there that has looked into yeah. how meditation has affected people's performance on the job? Yep. And even looking at specific jobs, such as ones that are high stress versus ones, ones that are low stress, baseball player versus secretary, yeah. EMT professional versus lawyers, snipers versus carpenters. So, I don't know about that last part. Um, there are definitely studies showing that impacts workplace. You might be interested in a book called Search Inside Yourself. Yeah, exactly. So out at Google, there is the guy who was in charge of HR, started meditating, he realized this was really good. So he tried to bring you know, MBSR you know, into Google. No one signed up, even though they're all stressed out, right? <laughs> so then he realized, okay, well, so they called it mindfulness for uh, interpersonal interaction or something like that, because that's you know, all the programmers really that's something they were willing to admit that they needed help with. So they all started doing mindfulness for that reason. But of course, they got the, health, the stress reduction benefits as well. So the book talks about all about bringing mindfulness into Google. Um, so there's that. And there's also um, a book by George Mumford. He worked with a bunch of elite basketball players. Um, and so there's definitely, and there's a, several people who have worked with elite sports athletes bringing mindfulness to it. And again, it's been extremely beneficial. So like George Barkley and stuff like that have used mindfulness among other people. Um, so definitely, so I don't know about every single solitary and is it better for you know, this per type of person versus that type of person, but certainly even for high stress people, for athletes, it's highly effective. There's also um, quite a few Wall Street bankers who admitted that the only way they could do what they do is because they meditate. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I recently came across a few graphs. I think it was of EEGs, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, when the brain frequencies of the frontal, mid, and, and the hind are all at the same level, a certain magic happens. And um, I think, I know for sure transcendental med meditation and there are other methods out there that are lesser researched. Um, wondering if anyone here has input on what exactly comes of, of that magic, so to speak, in the short and long term over someone's period of life, whether it accumulates, accelerates, exponential, anything having to do with just when all the brain frequencies throughout the brain are evenly balanced. You go first. You go first. I, I don't know about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not sure about the magic, to be honest. <laughs> so. Yeah, maybe we, we should not use the magic. I think uh, if we talk about the brain wave, we use the EEG, right? Yeah. Peter has done lots of work using EEG on mindfulness meditation. Yeah, we also have some study. 
You know, our brain always send the message through the electric way, based on the neurotransmitter. Yeah, they always work. So one person receives meditation. There are various meditation. So many years ago, one kind of meditation can improve alpha wave from the back of the brain, yeah, that move to the front. It's one method. That recent method also find the theta wave, theta wave. So alpha waves is uh, when you close your eyes, the alpha waves increase a little bit. Yeah, when people age, the alpha waves decrease. So theta waves means theta wave means you are in a attention state, but you also relaxed, a little bit slow. So some meditation study also found a gamma wave, right, very fast. So I think that this is just one index of brain activity, right? Something happening in the brain. So some people explain, oh, you are more attentive. This is why alpha wave, theta wave. Some people said, oh, the brain more synchronized. This is why gamma wave. Yeah, just like we sleep every night, so your brain wave change. Right. So the integration, though, is that gamma or theta, or what? When there's the integrative effect, what wave would, would fit that description? Do you know. I, I think, think what you're talking no about. There's no conclusion, right? Yeah. yeah. I I'm guessing what you're talking about is the study that Richie did in Antoine many years ago, where they had the monks, and so when the monks go into their meditative state, they have what you're uh, describing, which is a high amplitude gamma across the entire brain. Um, I don't know that they called it magic, though. But I think they just said that when the, when the monks are meditating, that's what happens. Thank you. Yeah. Peter, you want to say something? Peter, you want to say something? What did, what did I want to say? Oh, sorry. Um, the, something about the magic, I hope. Oh, not about the magic? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we want to hear about. No, I mean, uh, I think I just wanted to add, so because it was a question of synchronization for for any uh, oscillating activity, for any brain waves to be to be picked up, this means that this is an indication that there is synchronization. Yeah. So otherwise, if if every neuron was was firing randomly on its own, we wouldn't pick up anything from the surface. So it doesn't matter which which frequency range we look at that whenever we see a, a clear oscillating activity, this means that, that the there is a large... is a synchronization, you mean? Yeah, this is, yeah, a, is an index that there is synchronization. And then the general idea is if, if we are... The, the higher frequency ranges, like gamma and, and so on, so around third of, from 30, 35 hertz upwards, that this is a synchronization that happens more on a local level. Yeah, so it's more clo close... In, in, in specific brain regions, more or less, or closely related brain, re located brain regions, and then the the slower synch uh, oscillations that they are more related to long range synchronizations. So this this gives a bit of an idea, but for a, for anything meaningful to happen in the brain, it doesn't. Uh, we need uh, or we need this synchronization that uh, we need a lot of neurons doing the same thing at the same time, <laughs> and this then actually shows up as electrical activity on, on on the brain and one cannot draw conclusions from seeing that there is there is a wave what the what the content of the experience is of course this we, we cannot see at all yeah so and one can also not necessarily say that an increase is better than a decrease, or the decrease is better than an increase. You know, it, we just see maybe some, some changes, and then we need to, the introspection, actually, the sub, sub, subjective experience to actually link yeah, the, what we observe in, in brain activity, to link it, what actually might be happening. Yeah, so then we can get some understanding what these different signatures might mean. Yeah? Yeah. And there we are still very much at the beginning. Yeah? So we say linking so-called third-person data to first-person person data. There are some discussions how we can do this and a few attempts at doing this, but it's still sure. quite, sure. quite limited. Yeah? Is it is yeah. maybe, ca can I just add this? I, I'm just thinking about the, your bias question. Yeah? much earlier on. So another way of looking at it is actually that we're using first-person data there. Yeah? So, and of course, you can see it as a bias, 
but actually if for studying meditation, ideally we, we, the researcher has some idea uh, what they're studying. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in the same way that maybe somebody who studies sports has some idea what the sports is they're studying. Mm -hmm. So but just in some disciplines, it's there mo people are more skeptical ab about biases than in other disciplines because maybe it looks more subjective because it's not so easy to observe it from outside. Just yeah. add one point. Yeah, uh, I think people tend to interpret certain mm. neural markers or physiology mm. index as good or bad. Mm -hmm. We turn to because from our belief yeah. experience. So the, just like Peter said, the increase or decrease of the spring wave, certain thing, we cannot conclude increase the good, decrease the bad. So decrease the stress hormone, we think is good, <laughs> right? Yeah, increase the brain activity, we think is good. But some study also show the increase means you put a lot of effort. You are not in a relaxed state, not saving lots of energy. So related to bios, so everybody has bios including researcher, because everybody is in learning state, in the learning journey for the whole life. We certainly have bias, we acknowledge. Also, science, it doesn't mean it's a guaranteed way. Mm -hmm. it's, you can show the absolute truth. It's a relative truth. We just <laughs> try, to, try to track the truth. We are on the way, in not a conclusion yet. Yeah. Uh. We'll continue with the question. Yeah. Yeah. So can I? Yeah. Um, okay. Sarah, unfortunately, the, the future is is now improving on the year. <laughs> Sarah has to catch a, a train, so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. You can. You can. We are not stopping. We just, you can leave, but. <laughs> uh, you can ask your question. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, come, I come out of the extreme western edge of the eastern intuitive traditions and um, there's a formulation from, from Philip Kap, uh, Roshi, Kaplo, Kaplo Roshi that unlike what you said, um, the Buddhist path depends on, on three pillars, one of them being faith in the, in the record of transmission that there is something to be reached. It can't necessarily be accurately described in, in, uh, in language, but that faith as a structuring, in his view, was imperative. Um, and I was, I was sort of disappointed in, in, in his disciple or of the, 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 the son of one of his, his, his brother disciples not bringing that onto the floor, but, you know, but in, but in regard to the reworking of, of negative emotion, what Philip Kaplan Roshi also, also was very clear, um, and I, I heard him in person, um, advocate one hour of meditation a day to keep a practice going. In, that, in his mind, that was sufficient. And two hours to move forward. And once I started to practice that, I realized that it was like clockwork, that there would be a shift of experience. And it would last the, the first shift in experience into a, into a relaxation kind of thing, and a calmness, wouldn't really shift my experience the rest of the day. But what would happen at the two, at the second and third increments were decisive in work in reworking my emotional life for the entire rest of the day. And that's, that's talked about in the, in, the, in the western edge of these traditions in the Kabbalah as being, as each of us having, having levels of soul, or five levels of soul. And when you activate a higher level in, the, in that mapping, it's just a mapping, then the energies are still there, but they're reworked in a greater integration. And, and uh, okay, so now I, want, now I wanted to ask the panel about something related to that teaching of Philip Kaplan Roshi, who was really the first American Zen master, in advocating 
an hour a day of meditation as a minimum for keeping a meditative practice going, what I hear around me for the last decade in the, in the Buddhist world and also in the TM world is 20 minutes a day will do you. And that's not my experience about something. It, it's, neither, it's neither what I heard from a master or it, my, in my experience it's not borne out. So is that just marketing? What is that about? <laughs> and what's the research about, about quantity and quality? So it's a good question, actually. You ask uh, uh, the quantity and the quality of practice, and uh, what's this quantity and quality can benefit, can influence life, right? Um, this is my experience. Yeah, when I started my training, when I was young, so it pushed me hard. Similar to you, we do at least two hours per session. Try to build the foundation of your physiology change. It's my experience. Then later on, when you build this physiology change, like, like very intensive training, make something change, right? This kind of change can transfer to the daily life, but you need to be aware. So our study also show the length of training, length of practice really matter. It means lasting effect can influence. Also the quality of practice is most important. Like you sit an hour, but always mind wandering. So the quality of practice maybe just five minutes, 10 minutes. It happened. So in market, I think everybody's busy. When I moved to US, I was told New Yorker is the busiest group, right? Yeah, this is why American love the fast food, fast life. So certainly the person cannot practice an hour, two hours per day, but they can do 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Like, I don't have a five-star hotel room to leave, but I can leave a three-star. So I just, I think it's the flexible way, it's the compromising way, but if a person really want to become a professional, whatever trainer, master, practitioner, as I learned from my teacher, my master, they practice over two hours per day, over. And they enjoy, they not just force them to do, I need to one hour, two hour, no, they enjoy. You can't not do it once you start. It's it's just the quality of life is just, it's something different entirely. It's the world to come. That's the way it's talked about in the Western tradition. It's, the, it's entering the world to come while you're here. Yes. I think you may have a different idea, right? Well, <laughs> I, I've met many people who have meditated for decades, many, many long retreats and long hours and are complete assholes. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I've met myself, you know. But, uh, no, but, uh, <laughs> no, but the quality but I, versus the quantity thing is no, but important I think it's, uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, I do think to get good at something, if we think of it as a skill or a tool, to also takes practice. So I think both of those things are true. Yeah. But, but the, fa the faith question is a different question. But I think it's dangerous to think Treated. about if you just clock in enough hours, mm -hmm. then you're good. You know, I think that's, I'm always worried about that. And... Yeah. No. yeah, yeah. So I think it's more about dedication and relationship. But the yeah. suffering when the, when the quantum leap kicks in, that's critical. When you, not, when you do it, you, 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 you see how long it takes you to do it. But, mm -hmm. but it's a, there's nothing to argue with, it's just experience. Yeah. Right. Uh, these are the last two questions, and please make them brief because we are over our time. So this question is informed by uh, two of the conversations that happened. One of them was the conversation about intention when, um, I forget, I don't know, I don't remember the lady's name, but was talking about the importance of intention when you're meditating. And then the other conversation was the one where, um, sorry, I clearly don't know anyone's name, but uh, when you were talking about um, the Buddha, the Sangha, and the Dharma, and how it's more than just meditation. And um, that got me thinking, because in theory, if I were like, an evil person or like very selfish, I could just do um, 
concentration meditation, get very good at concentrating, make myself more effective at like getting rich and powerful and harmful or whatever. Um, so if we're just kind of, if you look at meditation or like how meditation is studied in labs, is it kind of just extracted from the greater picture that it is of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha? And is that a fair, are we kind of shortchanging the tradition from which it's steeped? Right. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Well, I think when you take the Sangha out, you're shortchanging tradition. You're actually leaving out like the third leg of a stool, which doesn't stand well. And for me, when I don't have relationships with peers in a process, I get pretty in my head. And so I think to stay in relationship is so, for me, has been really essential for my process and my path. And it's not easy, I think it's hard one. But I think that, I'd be so curious if that's ever even brought in as a variable for, in research. Go mm -hmm. cool question, I, go ahead. Yeah, I, yeah. Of course, as when we're doing empirical or scientific research, we somehow, we have to kind of define and, and limit the the conditions that, that we're working in. Yeah, so that, that's a, the one question is, how are we investigating this? And I think another question is, how is meditation practice applied in the, in the world? Yeah? Mm -hmm. So and, and for some research, we try to, uh, to isolate the, the, the meditation more, so especially if we're directly interested in what are the, the for instance, neural processes of what is going on. If the, if the influences are so complex, including other people, you know, mm -hmm. then actually we have, a, then we might not see, see such, such pure signals, if you want. Yeah? So that's the one thing. So, and, but as long as the research, the, the science is aware of it, that we're kind of, like we do in, in many other fields as well, that we isolate it, to study it, and, but then it, that it's about putting it together again, then I think this is fine. If one, if one then would take it to mean that meditation practice in isolation, yeah, on one's own, without any framework, without intention, without just doing it as a as an isolated technique would be uh, would be the way then then I think we would make a mistake you know, you know uh, I think it's a great question and mm. I would want to you know look at it both in its historical context but also outside of it because those three words are specific to the Buddhist tradition so if you say well how is that going to be applicable to everyone then you could you know I, I translate it as something like the Buddha has to do that orientation has to do with the transparency of your own awareness to yourself. In other words, a kind of a self-knowledge that maybe comes about through meditation or maybe through, through something else. The Dharma is the law of the psyche or the law that you find that works in terms of the structure of how you are in the world. And Sangha is your community. Sangha, you know, so that might be two people might be five people. It doesn't have to be, you know, a religious community. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, we're all embedded in community. So the question is, how do we relate to each other, you know, dare I say, in the here and now? <laughs> <laughs> Just to contradict myself. Uh, so <laughs> add, Thank you. Add one thing uh, related to the individual group. Yeah, the research certainly want to limit the factors. So want to get something, then try to add more. But in reality, my data shows. So actually, the trainer, the teacher, also is an active ingredient mm -hmm. in the meditation. Then the group setting, like community we use, the group relationship, the dynamic, is also important in supporting some people, not everyone. Some people prefer individual practice. Some people benefit more from the group session. We find both situations. Yeah. yeah. So some people even said uh, this culture more individualized culture than Eastern more collective culture. But I find all difference. It depends on the person. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I agree. Thank you. Um, I was hoping that some of you would have discussed the benefits of, of meditation. Um, 
and in, 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 in meditating, it, it uh, helps me bring my awareness and my attention into a single moment, uh, focusing on the breath. And, and, and uh, I can then, when I apply it to, to reading, to bring that same degree of concentration to, to reading, it not only speeds the rate at which one reads, but it improves uh, uh, recollection and, and, and cognition. Um, uh, another thing is that meditation um, uh, 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 helps um, uh, me, me find my own center. It helps me uh, focus on what other people are saying without my judging and without my, you know, thinking about what I'm going to say in response. Um, uh, I've been hyperkinetic well, from the time I was a child. And I'm still in my old age. You know, it's very difficult for me to s sit still. Uh, but in meditation, I can find the stresses in the various places in my body, and I can focus on that and uh, and 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 make peace with that, and let them let it, you know. And I can I can sit still in meditation where it's very difficult for me to do it at other times. Uh, and there there are so many things that med that meditation um, it really helps in in dealing with my 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 daily life. And I was I was hoping that you know this discussion would have included more of that. Uh, but nonetheless, thank you very much. Thank you. That's it. Thank you.